Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of the Microgreen Show. With today's episode, we are going to speak with Christina Johnson over at NASA. She's doing her postdoctorates over there and I got to interview her. So let's go on with that episode. I am a postdoctoral researcher, so I finished my PhD a couple of years ago, and I taught for a little bit, and then I came back to research, and I am at Kennedy Space Center looking at microgreens as a crop for space flight. So I did my PhD at Miami University, which is in Ohio. Um, I worked with uh, space flight research for my PhD, and I for that, I uh, took a model organism called Arabidopsis thaliana. It's a plant that's in the mustard family. And I sent it up to space on the shuttle discovery in 2010. And uh, then those plants grew for 14 days and they came back and we looked at their development and growth. Uh, they were grown in the dark because we didn't have uh, the opportunity to have lighting in that hardware at the time. I spent almost 10 years uh, looking at plants, uh, looking at their transcriptome, so looking at their genes and looking at all of the different ways that their growth was impacted by the spaceflight environment, the microgravity of spaceflight. And so uh, transitioning from that model organism to microgreens was really easy because I was looking at them with a very similar time frame, like shortly after germination, I was really looking at that early stage of development already. And so when I saw that microgreens might be good nutritionally for spaceflight, I was just so on board. I was like, okay, I got to I got to look at this a little closer for my postdoc. Well, nice, nice. That, that sounds so amazing that uh, you get to do all of that cool uh, stuff. You know, I know me yeah. as a kid, I've always wanted to be an astronaut. Like, I, I mean, ever since a kid, that that's what I wanted to do. And then I ended up, you know, just, you know, really loving plants and never knew that I would, I would have an opportunity to work, work, work with these guys. So, so I'm very honored for that. Yeah. So thank you. Well, yeah. Well, we love that you're so willing to chat about your expertise with us. So um, something that I have is um, my research is in collaboration with the USDA. We bring a lot of uh, scientists from academia into conversations as well. So uh, to clarify your role, uh, you are a uh, consultant in the industry that comes in and, and joins us for these chats and helps us to think about these problems that we're facing with microgreens. And so I, I'm glad that that you're on board with helping us out. And I love that that so many people are interested in microgreens and helping us get microgreens to space. And we, what's great about them is it's so easy for anyone to grow them. Even if you don't grow them well, you can still get a lot of nutrition out of them. You know, within a few days, you have something to show for your work. You don't have to wait their whole life for them to make these little fruits and then you hope that they taste good. No, you've got it right there. You're like, okay, this is great. I've got everything done within like a week or two. <laughs> so some of our potential crops for um, space flight. So uh, there's one that I really like. Um, there's a mustard called Mizuna. And that is one that has been grown in space for a very long time uh, in various studies. And it's been grown by Russians. It's been grown by Americans. It was grown by Christina Cook, who just got back. Um, and it's, it's just one of these really hardy plants. And so looking at that for a microgreen for space flight, we've already got it proven as like, hey, this plant can live in space. Just looking at it at the microgreen age, I think it'd be really fun to, to have that up there. We know it's got a good flavor that the astronauts like up there. Another one that looks really exciting are radishes. Um, they have a big punch of flavor. So either daikon radishes or the, um, the red radishes, the, the little little punch of, of yum that come from radishes. So the, the great thing with radishes is they have that, that pack of flavor. They have a lot of biomass really quickly and they have these beautiful leaves that, that are fun to look at too. So there's a few things that the astronauts are, are uh, drawn to crops for. They, they like it when the, they're pretty to look at. They, they want to, to see something that makes them happy that they're growing. If, if they're growing and they look unhealthy while they're growing it the whole time, it doesn't boost morale 
you know, morale's pretty important up there on the space station. So if we can give them something that's reliably healthy, and that's something that they, they enjoy. But also their flavor, sense of flavor is off in space flight. Their flavor receptors are kind of dead, and all of the fluid shifts to their head when they're in microgravity. Their sense of of taste is just off. They can't taste things like they used to. The the flavors are, they need flavors that are just a punch of flavor. And so finding microgreens that can give them that flavor is, is something that's a bit of a a quest for us. Um, Giving them something that'll, that'll make them excited and go, oh wow. So things like uh, the mustards and the, um, the radishes, maybe some herbs like a basil or a mint, um, you know, things that, that really have a big punch of flavor, but also have the nutritional supplementation that they really need. Just because a lot of the viewers don't understand, um, you know, a lot, mm-hmm. of, a lot of my teaching has been about teaching about from a commercial point of view, right? So I teach a lot from this commercial point of view that I've been involved with. Um, so it's a lot of different than than when you're growing for space. Um, and, and I just want to, to clarify that for the viewers, that when you're growing for space, you're not growing to bring your labor costs down and to bring all of that. So, so what growing commercially, where it's all about cost and efficiency and sustainability. Uh, and, and with growing in space, do you want to describe the, uh, the key points? Growing in space, you need to make sure that it's going to work. So that's one. <laughs> Got to make sure that their time is well spent. The astronauts only have a very little bit of time to do science and even less time to prepare their food. So if we're trying to combine the worlds of science and food at the same time, it's like not much of their time that they have to give to us. So uh, we need we need a crop that isn't going to require a whole lot of the crew time. Uh, another thing that's really important is making sure that doesn't weigh too much to send it up. So the, that includes the whole habitat that the plant is growing in. We would need to make sure that we optimize things like lighting uh, so that we're not using too much power. Um, we need to make sure that we optimize the space. There's very limited space. up. I mean, there's plenty of space outside of the International Space Station, <laughs> but there isn't very much inside of the space station that we could grow things in. Um, so we have to make sure that, that we optimize the space. We need to optimize, which microgreens are really great for optimizing space, aren't they? We want to make sure that we get a good enough yield to be worth their time. So we want to, to have a higher yield. Another thing that's very important for crops in space is the nutritional aspect. We need to make sure that there is a lot of nutrition packed into a very small amount of biomass. And that is something that microgreens are fantastic with. The other thing that's really important is food safety. We need to make sure that the astronauts don't get sick trying to eat the crops. Now with a longer duration crop, there's a lot of things that can grow and proliferate on the plants and and it can get to be difficult. The fungus that's naturally occurring on the space station at this point that's been proliferating there for a long time can take over and damage plants that are growing there. We saw that with the zinnias that were grown in 2017 on the space station. They, they did have a great harvest, but some of the leaves, especially earlier on, um, they had a lot of fungal damage. But with microgreens, you're growing them for such a short amount of time. It doesn't have the same opportunity for the potentially harmful pathogens to proliferate. Watering is a big issue in space flight, making sure that we have even watering. When you take away gravity, water tends to form these spheres and it isn't evenly distributed. And it's very hard to make sure that everything's going to be getting the water that it needs without suffocating the roots. Roots also need access to oxygen. Uh, They do need to respire And that's something we don't really think about with plants. We think of photosynthesis, but they also respire. And that's a very important part of their process. And the roots are an important place to make sure that they can get the oxygen that they need. The access to oxygen and the access to water uh, without bringing those two together. Those are the the two biggest challenges, I think. Well, if you want to get into space research um, with crop development, it's, it's actually kind of a weird path. Um, the biggest advice that I have is don't give up. 
<laughs> keep learning. Um, I think that it's really easy to fall out of the academic path that you set yourself up for. You, you think, okay, I want this goal. I need to do all of these things to get there. And you just, you have to jump through whatever hoops you have to, to get there, whether or not you want to do that assignment, whether or not you want to, you know, spend enough time doing that. Something that's kept me going and, and staying the course and making sure I finish my PhD was um, really good mentors and also a sense of creativity and joy as I'm doing the work and just having a lot of fun with it along the way, um, finding ways to make it interesting. Find someone to look up to, someone that can help you out and help encouraging you um, when you get frustrated along the way. That's, that's something that, that will be really, really helpful no matter what direction you go, no matter what choice you make in life. You, you've got to have someone that, that can say, you know, you are smart. You know, you, you can do this. I know you feel dumb right now, but it's actually, you know, failure is part of, part of the process. And the more you fail, the more you learn. When we're preparing crops for spaceflight, any crops, we have something called crop readiness level. And um, when you're looking at things like uh, a rocket that's going to space, they have flight readiness level or any technology that's going to space. And so we took that concept and we applied it to plants and, and said, okay, these are our crop readiness levels. So any one crop, any one variety that we want to grow in space flight, we send through the crop readiness process and we, we make sure that it can do well in um, progressively difficult environments, getting closer and closer to that microgravity environment. A group that, that screens a lot of crops for us is the Fairchild Botanical Garden. They actually have a team of, of like 200 schools across the U.S. that grow different crops uh, in different in their classrooms in in their own different environments and then they tell us okay these ones did well these ones didn't and they give us things like germination data that are really applicable to microgreens but then they also give us like the whole health of the plant they grow them out for the whole lives so they haven't been doing much with microgreens yet yeah so we we have to figure out okay do they do well on earth and will they do well with the kind of environment neglect that the astronauts might give them. So if it does, if we have a plant that does well in 50 classrooms, you know, in Puerto Rico, where they have no power for a month, in, you know, Nebraska, where they, you know, forgot about them while they went on spring break, you know, <laughs> whatever happens, uh, whatever things that they face, if they do well in all these different places with all these different variables, if they do well, then okay, we'll look at them. <laughs> we'll give them a shot. Uh, occasionally, um, like a seed company will contact us and be like, oh, you got to look at this plant. And we're like, okay, we'll tell the Fairchild folks about it. And from there, we go on to, okay, we need to grow these in our growth chambers that mimic the um, atmospheric conditions on the space station. So things like elevated CO2, um, things like uh, because the it's an enclosed environment in any controlled environment that's enclosed where people are living in it, you end up with uh, the CO2 in that room going up. And that's something that's, you know, something that controlled environment, I guess, has been looking at for a long time, right? Um, so that's something that is a big issue with crops. There are plenty of crops that do great here on earth that once we get them into those enclosed spaces, they fail. And so, um, they have necrosis or, you know, whatever different problems they run into. They don't. So with microgreens, you know, we still have to send them through that, even though they wouldn't need to live quite as long. Uh, so then we, we screen them with, with those kinds of conditions, the humidity, the, the temperature. Uh, we'll, we'll take the, the temperature logs from the space station for a given month and we'll be like, okay, we're going to run them just like it was on the space station for that month and we'll see how they do and then from there we can go okay these ones did well these ones didn't and so it's just kind of a progression um figuring out what they'll do and then along the way we also have to make sure we have the right hardware in place and that's something that we're still developing for the microgreens is making sure that we have the right hardware either an insert with an existing hardware like the veggie or the advanced plant habitat and making sure that we have the right flight hardware that will make sure that the water gets to the plant properly um, 
you know, figuring out what kind of crew time we need to make it happen. And so at Kennedy Space Center, we have a few different kinds of growth chambers. They are, we have some walk-in chambers that we use for some of the bigger crops. Uh, for microgreens, we've been growing them in region chambers. We have smaller region chambers and bigger region chambers. I'm super grateful for Ray Wheeler. <laughs> So just the fact that he kept this research going through a ton of budget cuts is really impressive. If this research wouldn't be here without his efforts. So there were many years there where it was just him and his cubicle and he didn't even have very good lab space. Um, and he would just contact everyone in academia and everyone in industry and anyone he could possibly reach out to about space crops and, you know, trying to get collaborations going. And he would, you know, visit these universities and, and talk about all of the things that are so important to us. Um, and he finally, you know, he built this program up into what it is now. And now we have, you know, Joya Massa, Ray Wheeler, we have Matt Romine, we have like a whole group of us, um, you know, uh, including that are NASA and then the contractors, uh, like, uh, Lachelle Spencer and, you know, Jacob Torres and, and then we have all of our, um, our plant microbe interaction people. I mean, there's just so many people on our team that are so special to me and so important to me. And I, I feel like I wouldn't be able to do this research without this incredible team of people. Definitely Ray is someone that that deserves a lot of thanks for keeping this going. And it was funny because when I, uh, when I was putting this proposal together to do this postdoctoral work, um, I was initially in touch with Joya about it. Joya Mass is incredible. She's, she's been a good mentor to me for the past decade. Uh, when I started my PhD, I first met her at a scientific meeting and she was super encouraging. Um, and so she was someone that, that really made a big difference and um, when I when I started putting this proposal together, I naturally thought of her, and and I was like, you know, I. She's like, this is this is a Ray project, and I was like, what? That that's that's like, I can't talk to Ray. He's he's too important. Like I'm intimidated to list him as my mentor for this. <laughs> and she broke out laughing. She was like, don't be afraid of Ray. You've met Ray. He's so sweet. Like, he's, he'd love to do this. He'd love to be your mentor. <laughs> like, there's no reason. But we have in our minds that these people, they're like our idols, right? And, um, and they're just people, too. <laughs> I do have a public Facebook page that's called I Wish I Could Study Space Biology. And I started this page uh, about 10 years ago, when I first found out that I was going to do a space flight study, I, I thought, you know, I bet there's other people who wish that they could do what I'm doing. And um, so then I started sharing little tidbits, and news about space biology and things like that. So um, you can send me a message through that page, you could follow my page, um, and then send me a message through that page. And I'll, it goes to my my messenger on my phone and I'll get it right away and I can I can definitely respond that way. Thank you so much for for chatting today. I enjoyed your company. Um, I, I'm so glad you could have me on your show. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Microgreen Show and thank you Christina for joining us and that was an awesome interview. Like always, happy Friday and stay safe.